Hi, Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network. You know, it's Thanksgiving season, and over the past few years, our cameras have visited a lot of places that have historical significance. We have visited Plymouth Plantation, taken a tour of the Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth. We've seen the Mayflower II in Dry Dock over in Fairhaven to get an exclusive visit and tour of that. Also, we talked with the captain of the Mayflower II just a couple years ago while the ship was seeking shelter from a storm after it had extensive renovations down in Connecticut. So this year, we decided to take our cameras to the place where the Pilgrims first landed. For five and a half weeks, they were in Provincetown before they made their way to Plymouth. We're gonna go visit the Pilgrim Monument and the Provincetown Museum. So it's time for another road trip here at New Bedford Cable Network. Join us as we take a trip to Provincetown. here inside the museum with Courtney Hurst. She is the executive director of the Pilgrim Memorial and the Provincetown Museum. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. As I said before, I wanted to, to give us the tour that you would give people because as we do this show, um, obviously we want to talk about uh, obviously the Thanksgiving holiday is going to, you know, it's so important to people, but it's a great opportunity for people to learn about the other story mm -hmm. that people may not know. Um, we've been to Plymouth before, but Here's where they first landed. So again, thanks for having us. But tell us a little bit about the museum and what we're gonna see today. Yeah, so we're standing in what used to be called the Mayflower Room. It's now called the Our Story Exhibit, which I'll walk you through in just a little bit. But we're standing in front of the Mayflower replica. And the reason that this exhibit is significant in our history overall is because, as I said, it used to be focused on the Pilgrim story. So we had mu big murals on the wall, which you'll go around and see the newer ones, but we had it like this for decades. I was, a, I was born and raised here. I'm fifth generation Provincetown. So I've run through this museum <laughs> hundreds of times, yeah. hundreds of times. And I always zip through this room and you think that this is the story, the Pilgrim story. They came, they found the Native Americans. They, and then a few years ago, the, my predecessor, our executive director, David Widener, was having some school kids up here. And he was talking about the Pilgrim's arrival and what story, what version of that story this room used to tell. And we, the, in the audience, in the gathering, were a representative of the Wampanoag tribe. And they very, tr very straightforwardly let David and I know just how wrong we had gotten yeah. this story. And they started pointing out really, really small but really powerful things. The murals that I've mentioned, if you really looked at them, they pointed out all of the pilgrims look um, somewhat friendly, they look scared, they look like they're running. All the Native Americans look aggressive, they all look exactly the same. There's no distinction between their faces, between their dress, whereas that wasn't the case for the pilgrims. That was one small thing that they pointed out and just how we had told a inaccurate and a whitewashed version of the story. So here we are in Provincetown trying to get all the glory that they landed here, the pilgrims landed here, and that's definitely an important story, but we had not told the accurate story of what actually happened when they came how they treated the Wampanoag people, how they stole the corn in Truro. So we retold the story. We left the boat here because it's a beautiful boat and it is important to, to commemorate the fact that the pilgrims did arrive here. They signed the Mayflower Compact in our harbor, which is depicted right over here. 
And they signed it in a harbor because they knew before they got off the boat that it would be wise to have a document that would govern them once they hit shore. So it's really the first governing document of our, of our democracy, really, is the Mayflower Compact. So they landed in when? They landed in 1620, in, November no, 11th in 1620. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so, yep. this, it, it, so they landed at a tough time. They really I mean, did. I mean, think about, yeah, think about, yeah, when we get up on that hill a little bit, think of that wind whipping through. So they came, they got off the boat, they took what's called a shallop, which is a smaller boat. They rowed it in from the Mayflower. And then they spent five and a half weeks here. So that is when they were trying to figure out if they could live here. They made it to Truro, they found the water, they had the interactions with the Native Americans, the Wampanoag people, which is what this exhibit now tells a more accurate telling of. They spent five and a half weeks here and they recognized that it just wasn't protected enough. It wasn't, you know, the sandy soil wasn't good for growing, no. the wind and the salt were intense. So they got back on the boat after five and a half weeks and they headed to Plymouth. And then that's where they settled. So that's really why Plymouth gets all the glory and the fact that they settled there. Um, but this is where it actually started. Has the land changed that much, much since they landed? We talked about, as you said, the sand and the and the. And I mean, the not much, sauce. right? No. Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, it's still, <laughs> it's still the same land. Yeah. 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 So, so I mean, it does make it. I don't want to say inhospitable, but very difficult then to, yeah. to grow and what have you. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Let's take a let's yeah. take a look at through the thing here. Absolutely. So the great thing is here, you tell the story in this sort of wing. First of all, the museum is d divvied up into different sections, if you will, wings. Um, and there's a lot to see in here, and we're going to get to all of it too, because a lot of it is, uh, while we talk about the museum and the, and the story of the, of the Pilgrims landing, you have the history of province down here too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to go over, whaling and some other, some some prominent residents of province down. So I want to get to those two in a little bit. but. We're here, obviously, and you want to talk about this, and I think it's great because you've got things divvied up here, and I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you know, as we go through here, sort of tell the story for our viewers. Yeah. So I think what's important about our telling of this story, which is different from how other museums have told the story of the Pilgrim's arrival, is that we decided in this redoing of this exhibit, which I have to give a call out to Smoke Signals, is the company who helped us with this exhibit, owned by a Wampanoag, also a member of our board of trustees, Stephen Peters. And they were the ones who did this for us, hence why it's called Our Story. Um, finally letting them come in and tell their story from their perspective, not us trying to tell it for them. So I think what's important about this exhibit is it starts before the pilgrims arrived. They were here before 1620. They were here before the pilgrims showed up, and not many stories, not many uh, accounts of history share it that way. Yeah, so, 1605, the first date that you it, have. And it really starts to give what, what the Wampanoag people, what the, what the natives were doing here before the pilgrims showed up. So the exhibit takes you through um, what they were up to, how they were living their life. We have some great interactive videos. Um, putting the exhibit together was great. We worked with Smoke Signals, but Smoke Signals worked with local actors in Provincetown. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these videos are local actors, so it's kind of fun to see them. Um, like they recreate the signing of the Mayflower Compact, and it's done in a restaurant called Ciro and Sal's in their basement. Um, so the videos themselves are fun to watch if you know Provincetown and the locals. Um, but it's, it basically moves around. It's interesting here, too, when you talk about at that time, like the economy and the industry, agriculture, hunting, gathering, fishing, whaling. I mean, not much, but it, that's what kept them going, mm -hmm. really. Um, and it's inter the political hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so it does tell the story of of what it was like. Again, this is before um, the pilgrims arrived. Yeah, and here I am talking about how it was important for the pilgrims to sign the Mayflower Compact on the boat. My, but they had. <laughs> They had a way that they were governing themselves here, and um, we came in and decided that we had a new way. So, um, yeah. Matriarchal, though, for their social structure. Yeah. Which I find interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, but again, I mean, you've got great depictions on these on these um, uh, murals too, and posters. Yeah. Yeah. Smoke signals was fantastic, and what we did was we redid all of the murals, but we kept up. Um, if you can just come right over here. This was one of the old ones, and I had already explained that that was one of the things that the Wampanoags pointed out to us when we first recognized we needed to redo the story, is this is kind of a little bit about what I was talking about, how we had depicted it. Yeah, and, and you actually talk about here why the change. Yeah, so we left this one up to show um, just how how wrong we had gotten it, and, and not, not trying to, obviously. We thought we were telling the right story. 
um, but it was just from one perspective and not from the people who are already here living it. Do you get a lot of, um, uh, I would imagine you do, school children and what have we you, do. classes that come in to, to learn the story we too? We do. We do, and this is, uh, this is an important thing for them to learn, and we recognize that even some of the people who come in here to our museum, it's not always well received. Uh, m m the majority of the time it is, and most of the time people call out how much they loved this mm. exhibit, and it's the first major exhibit we've put up. This museum is decades and decades old, and um, as we make our way through the museum, there are a lot of exhibits that haven't changed for a long time, and there's something precious about that. But this whole room was a pretty big investment for us at the time. I sat on the board at the time that we decided to do this, and it was full board engagement, full unanimous yeah. vote to just get the story right. So it was a big investment for us to put this much effort into this room, but we're so happy that we did and just so proud that we can start to tell the more accurate story. As we continue in the room, it's um Again, we go through the dates. Interesting map here about the Wampanoag territory, though. And well, all the territories. So this is a great, um, this is a great map to really break out the different tribes that there were. And this is sixteen sixteen. Too. Yep. So it's so, before they showed again, up. So it's kind of. Yep. yep. So this is all that was happening before that boat arrived. So and it's it, great that we got to keep the boat there, but tell the story right. around it. And um, if you look, you've got a Kushnet which is interesting, and underneath it is New Bedford. Um, would New Bedford people know that that would be the name. old name? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's interesting that people see that. But again, what an area that it covers. So uh, Michon is this area yep. back then. Pamet stayed the same. I mean, there's definitely Pamet and Truro. So those are the Indian names, correct? Yes. I just want to yes. make sure I get that. Yeah, that was all. They had their territories, they had it figured out, and then we And came. this is tough right here. This is, yeah, this is a really, and, and if you we were to watch the, um, the actual videos that go along with this story, it kind of fills in the blanks in between these murals and snippets of language. So tell us about this period of time, which obviously was devastating to the tribes. Yeah, so it was before the Mayflower Pilgrims showed up when a group of white people showed up and just spread disease and, and law and so many Native Americans lost their life just just because we showed up. So that's why when the pil when the Mayflower Pilgrims showed up, the Wampanoag had a reason to be fearful. It, you know, yeah. they had a real fear. The last time that white people showed up, they lost so much. So it wasn't like they were angry right off the bat just because other people showed right. up. They had a reason to be fearful, which a lot of people don't realize. So that's an important. This corner is an important predecessor to the pilgrims showing up and why the Wampanoags had the reaction they did. Not to mention the pilgrims' treatment of them when they arrived wasn't stellar. This is an interesting story here too, uh, the Thomas Dermer to Squantum story. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So Squantum uh, was captured and brought away, was taken away to be a slave, and in that time learned the language, learned, you know, basically had assimilated on some level. Um, so when he made his way back, um, he was able to give his tribe the, the length, so he had really given the tribe an advantage of understanding how the white people talk, how they operate. Um, so that's an interesting escape, came back, was able to leverage the, what he had learned to a certain degree to help the people, um, but then ultimately he was taken away again, so. <laughs> It doesn't end good for them no matter which no, no matter which panel we ended on. No. Yeah, so, so this is it. where we yeah, this is where we move into the pilgrims have arrived. And it's it's in a short I mean we started in the other corner, it was sixteen oh five. Yeah, so and it's so a, a very short period of time, fifteen years, sixteen twenty now, and now the pilgrims have arrived. They're here. And as we already talked about, they signed the Mayflower Compact before they got off the boat. How significant was the compact itself as a piece of, I don't want to call it rule or law or what have you, 
um, legislation. What is what is the compact? I mean, it gave them a ground set of rules that they were going to conduct themselves for. I mean, interesting to note that, of course, it was only men who signed it, of course, because that would have been the way it went in 1620. So, um, but they recognized that they needed a, a basics of how they were going to conduct themselves when they arrived. Um, so not a long document. We can show you a copy of it. I'm sure many have seen it. Um, but just basically outlining the basics of once we get on shore, how are we all going to conduct ourselves and how do we agree to that? This is uh, particularly interesting too, the first encounter. Um, yeah. So this is where, um, this is our new depiction of the faces, see, um, versus how it was in the old one. And yeah, this, and again, imagine that the Wampanoags were fearful. I mean, I just keep saying it because it's, it's just a, part, a point that gets lost. So the first interaction, the Wampanoags were fearful. The, the white, the pilgrims obviously were fearful as well entering right. this new land, not sure what they were gonna come up on. Um, so yeah, the, the, first, the first sight did not go, the first encounter did not go well. And then it was really once they got back on the boat and landed in Plymouth that, um, an understanding started to form between them and then that's where we get the somewhat fabled story of his sharing of the corn and the thanksgiving and all that um but it really was you know about a year later when there seemed to be some cohesiveness between so that's kind of where the story comes from from there so the indians uh, the, the the native americans that were here um uh, in provincetown area versus the ones in plymouth they weren't were they the same tribe no no no, 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 no i didn't no. think yeah, so yeah so so just the tribes in general. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just wraps up with the leadership at the time. We already pointed out that it was the it, it's, it's just curious. Yeah, I mean, it's curious yeah. that it, for, the, for the Native Americans, it was uh, uh, matriarchal leadership, which yep. is interesting. Um, you don't, I don't think people even know or think that. No, that, that was no. the case. And of course, the the pilgrims. Of course, William, William Bradford. Bradford yeah, um, he's probably the most well-known pilgrim. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Um, I wonder why that was, though. Smart, smart <laughs> people. <laughs> <laughs> they knew who the boss was. Yeah, they, they knew. knew. They knew. And I just want to point out over here some of the uh, artifacts that you yeah. have here. That. Uh, and so this was another learning moment for us. We used to have artifacts that were not authentic and also just weren't from this area. So they were artifacts from like the middle of the country that really had no relevance here and we didn't know enough to know that. Um, so part of it was not just redoing how we told the story but actually what artifacts we were sharing and trying to make them more of this area and more authentic. Um, and the craftsmanship is, is incredible. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, it really is. I mean, sometimes when you look at these, these beads, and you think that that was 400 years ago. There was no bead store that they went to. To get them all perfectly matching and color, it's just incredible. It's incredible. What's your favorite uh, artifact here? I mean, the, the pipe is... Yeah, the pipe's to, to a lot of fun. Is, is amazing. Yeah. I really just like, I love this sash belt. I think it's so beautiful and just meticulous. It is very impressive. Isn't it? And it, it's, I mean, you, and you really think about it, this is all from the local area. You yeah. really think about it at the yeah. time. So we're in another wing right now. Yes, if we've you moved will. into another wing. And I want to emphasize too that again, we're, we want to showcase the, the museum itself. Um, we're not just talking about the, 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 the pilgrims and, and the relevance there, but there's a lot of artifact here. This is an outstanding depiction. Yeah, isn't it fantastic? It's the Mary Heaton Vorse where they put on the, the productions, the plays. And I would love to have been alive back then in that in that atmosphere with those people all those creative types it's just incredible and this is a beautiful replica of it i think the model is by a woman named courtney allen the detail is amazing. yeah it's incredible yeah it's incredible Yeah, and it kind of stands in front of the part of the museum which talks about the famous artists and playwrights who have been in Provincetown. 
Provincetown is known for many things, not just the place that the Pilgrims showed up first, um, but for art and theater and so many influential national heroes got started here. Um, and so this is the portion of the museum that talks about how theater began in the early 1900s here, um, who some of the players were, no pun intended, the Provincetown players, and it really takes it through um, into the churches. Provincetown still has a very active oh, yeah. arts community where productions are done, Absolutely. especially in the summertime. There's Absolutely. lots of, lots of shows entertainment. that goes on. Yeah. Lots of entertainment, lots of art and artists and galleries. Yeah, it's, it's a thriving artistic community for sure. And then we're kind of in a noisier part of the museum right now. This is, it's interesting, for a museum that tells Provincetown's history, we only got our first LGBTQT plus cases about six or seven years ago when my predecessor David Widener was here. So this is the corner of the museum that is dedicated to telling some of those stories. So a great uh, organization called the Generations Project put up these three videos. Um, which tell part of the LGBTQT story in Provincetown, but really from a lot of Provincetown local native perspectives. So this first video, when it sets to the beginning, um, really focuses on a woman named Beta Cook, who lived to be, I think, in her 90s. She only died recently. Um, and just so her story of being, you know, coming out of the closet in Provincetown all those decades ago and what it was like for her. Um, so this is where it tells, starts to tell a little bit of the LBQT story. Um, and then right into this case, which is of the Hat Sisters, uh, which are um, icons in Provincetown. And if you notice, one of them actually works our front desk right now. So on the way out, you'll see Tim, one of the Hat Sisters. Um, so this was uh, an ode to them. For such a small town, we have such a huge impact on national news. I mean, the AIDS epidemic, Provincetown lived that. You know, the guys, came, as these stories point out, the guys came here to die, and the Provincetown women and community took care of them as their own. And that story in itself, it, start, it starts to be told here, and it's important that it's told here, but it's such a larger story that we could, and so many people could spend so much time on. Right. It's pretty incredible. So this is an interesting part because this is uh, a lot of things New Bedford has in common with Provincetown. This is a big one right it here. Really the is. fishing industries, uh, both prominent in their own in their own right. Um, amazing um, to see some of these artifacts. Tell us a little bit about these. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously we've got a replica of an old dragger, one of the bigger rigs that would go out, leave the harbor back in the day. Um, we've got some members of the different boats of the fishing fleet through the years. We've got some fishing paraphernalia. But you know, the interesting part of this story is that we're recognizing as a museum and as a collections committee that this Provincetown fishing story is, you know, has a few decades past this if we were to really tell an updated story. So our fishing story really stops at this, you know, the height of the fishing, the height of the fishing when there were tons of draggers in the harbor. Um, it's gotten a lot smaller. The wa working waterfront looks a lot different now with yeah. oysters and clams. So this is definitely a part of the exhibit, a part of the museum that we're going to update is the fishing story. Um, but per such an important and story. And per capita, Provincetown was one of the wealthiest oh, yeah. communities in the world. Oh, yeah. Just like at, at the time New Bedford oh, yeah. was. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, Powerhouse. Yeah. Yep. This is a good corner that depicts Provincetown's role in the whaling industry. Um, starts at the beginning, works its way around. Um, an interesting way to end this exhibit, if we were to redo it in the future, would be to end the whaling story with the whale watching tourism that's mm, out in our yeah. harbor. How we went from killing to protecting and seeking the whales is a pretty interesting story. But for now, it focuses on us in the whaling industry. And it's interesting, it's definitely separated in the museum. Your viewers won't really have a sense of it, but this whaling portion is separate from the fishing, from the gallery we were just in, because they were two different times. And this tells how it was initially whaling, the true story of it, how it eventually faded out and why. And then that's why the fishing story comes later. It's interesting too, when you look at some of the um, items here that you have, they are really old. And they, I mean, they tell a story too, I mean, from the 1800s, early 1800s, yep. and these are obviously in the later 1800s. Um, amazing, 1700s. amazing stuff right there. When you look at this picture, Union Wharf, which is the main mm -hmm. hub of Provincetown back in the day, I mean, it's active in a sense. You look how sort of busy those th places are. Yeah. 
Yeah, the Cook family. That was a big family in Yankee Whaling. And while we have it here too, I wanted you to, this is a, 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 a yeah, manuscript look like that is. This is what a whaler's desk might have looked like. Okay. A whale captain's desk might have looked like. So we've got the log, we've got books, we've got over here, we've got lanterns. We got some whale oil or a container for it over here. I think the books are uh, great items because they do tell a story and they, they are so really do. significant too, historically. Mm. Tell us about this book though, the Somerset Bible that's here. What a big um, Bible really. Yeah, I mean, isn't that crazy? That's on loan and this is just a way to tell, I mean, boats that have come, you know, the and H what we were found on the boats. The HMS Somerset? Yeah. One of the things that's, that's drawn my attention here, the, the detail on these uh, depictions of vessels, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, I mean, we're so lucky to have acquired these through the years from different boat builders uh, yeah. of these miniature boats. And we try to get a good range of the types of boats that have passed through our harbors for, right, yeah. for so many years. Um, um, and we do have plans to maybe bring them down because I'm glad you looked up and saw them because I feel like a lot of people are focused here and don't look up. But they really stand out. They nice. really are beautiful. And, and like you said, Provincetown Harbor. I mean... I, it, you're you're going back to the 1800s or early you know yes they would be in your harbor yeah. and i don't think people grasp that right now yeah. I mean, you look at this big schooner one in front of us here and schooner is still you know is still out there but uh, you know i don't know if a lot of people see it them. was a thriving harbor right This is a depiction of the Long Point settlement. So when we go out on the campus and we look across the harbor, you'll see Long Point, which is the arm of Massachusetts, the very tip. Mm -hmm. um, and back in the day, about 200 people used to live out on Long Point. Mm -hmm. And what's cool is if you go through town now, if you notice the houses, if you see one of those blue and white um, tiles in front of this really some of the really old houses in town, that means that they were actually floated over from when they once were on Long Point and came over across the harbor to be on this mainland. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have to stop by and, and, and stop at this item because when you see Provincetown's oldest fire engine, you can't help but stop and look no. at it. It is amazing to see this. And, and at the time, state-of-the-art technology. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it pumped water and everything. Yeah. The kids love this when they zip through the museum. My office is right over there and I can at least three times a day hear, oh my God, look at this fire engine. Tell, I mean, so tell us a little bit about this. How, uh, where'd we get this? So this, we've had this for, this has been here since the museum uh, was, was formed. So I don't think this is ever going anywhere. Um, and it's, you know, 1836, it dates back to. But what I think is cool about Provincetown's fire story is that up until very recently, it was entirely volunteer-based. Really? So you had these different pumper houses around, the, around town, um, and different guys were, you know, pumper house number one, pumper house number two, and they were all volunteers, which is pretty incredible to think of these guys. Usually it's families that decade after decade pass it on and carry it on. And it's just such a, I think, a beautiful tradition. In 1836, I mean, think about it. They have a structured fire department with, yeah. with equipment. Yep. And, then and we're all over this here, gear. too, I mean, I think, yeah, we gotta. We gotta show all the gear. I think the gear is fantastic here when you look at I think one of the coolest artifacts here is the um, melted glass. So up on High Pole Hill, where we, where we are right now, there used to be the town hall, the Provincetown Town Hall. And then there was a fire, and the town hall built down, f burned down, and then that's why when we built it with the monument now. So really old photos and paintings of Provincetown are without the monument and with the town hall. So this is from a piece from that town hall fire. Wow. Which it, is pretty it, it cool. Is, that is pretty cool. Yeah.
So this is an amazing exhibit right here. Um, and you can tell us about this, but this is, look at the, uh, the items in here, the craftsmanship, it's unbelievable. Yeah, this is a fan favorite for sure. It depicts the captain's parlor ashore, and it goes nicely with the one across the way, which are also uh, the captain's quarters. Um, so between these two, we hope to give a glimpse of what it might have been like to live in their life. And what they really get a kick out on this one is how the table, the lip has to go up because of the rocking and right. rolling the, of the boat. Uh, yeah. So everything had to be, have its place. And but to think of the room, the size of the room out on the boat for so long. Well, the thing is too, is, as I'm looking at it, what's amazing is, as you, as you look at this quarters, it still looks pretty modern for that time. Like yeah. it, 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 it I don't want to say it's comfortable, it's in a boat, but it does look better than what many people might think it would be yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. And the bed? Yeah. I mean, that's a real bed rated there. We got a bathroom, rain gear, captain's log. Yeah, this is a great little exhibit. And the captain's log, it looks like what, from 1865, I think yeah. it says? So. The, when you find artifacts like, like the captain's log and stuff like that, do those come up often or when you see s stuff like that? It's a mix. It's things that have been donated to us very generously. Once in a while there'll be an item that we see that's being auctioned off somewhere yeah. that we just feel like we have to have for our collection. That's rare. Um, but we probably will start doing more and more of that. And then oftentimes it's, items are just on loan. So as we put up new exhibits, which we'll be doing more and more of, we'll be looking to get other artifacts from other places. And I would imagine too, like you were saying, because you've got so many people, your fifth generation, other people from the town, really that's the items that yep. tell a story. Yeah. And they're, they're really, I mean, they're personal, but they're also really old. Yeah, they are cases. really old. Yeah, we walk a fine line up here. We want to be welcoming and tell people that we want Provincetown's history. And then at the same time, we don't want to line out the door with every attic no, <laughs> you're right. in boxes and boxes just for a storage, a storage uh, Because concern. some things may not be historical. They might not really. be, right. They just right, are what they right. are. Right. So that's always a fine line we walk, especially in a small community like this. I just noticed this and I didn't see it. The sextant? Yeah, tell us what that is. So that is a way to course, course the, to chart their course, quite simply. GPS back in the day. <laughs> Let's walk through this jawbone and feel like we're in the wet, the mouth of a whale. How did we pull this off? Yeah, this right? Is... It's incredible. Most people assume it's a rib, which would make sense, but it's the jawbone. Of a what whale? Of a humpback whale. Humpback whale. Yep. And this is actually where Vice President Harris stood when she came this summer, the day before she announced that she'd be the oh, candidate really? she was here. And she did all the photos here, which was pretty cool. So we're in the other wing here, we're up on the other side of the room, but it's interesting, um, you had <laughs> talked about Admiral McMillan earlier, yeah. um, but he has his own little section here. He has his own section. So who is he? Admiral McMillan is our hometown hero. So <laughs> he is a Provincetown local uh, who is just a very well-known Arctic explorer and just explorer in general. Uh, but we get a lot of questions when people see this because they're like, were there really polar bears in Provincetown? There were not. <laughs> Uh, we're not trying to trick anyone. It's the fact that he, our hometown hero explorer, brought them back with him. Um, and he and his wife, Miriam, both lived in Provincetown, so that was where they would take these explorations out of. So they would go from Provincetown to these far-flung places and really a pioneer in animals, in the Eskimos, in living among those people, and the research that he and his wife did. It's just not only were they explorers, but they were real educators, so they're a real sense of pride for our town. Well, and it's funny because you said that the, the trips originated here. And again, we go back to the other room when you think about it. Yep. Those vessels were in the harbor yeah. every day. Yeah, every day. And just going as a all way of life. World. So jump on and head, head yeah, up to the head polar to the bears. Artists, yeah. yeah. Some of the items here are, are, are interesting. Again, too. the beadwork. Bead, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, again, that is just. And it's it's from in the perfect Inuit, symmetry. It, the Inuit, uh, and then if you check out this narwhal tusk, this is real. Imagine how big this narwhal was if this is the tusk. It's wow. pretty crazy. 
The boots craftsmanship, the craftsmanship for the boot is amazing. And if you think the utilitarian of them, I mean, they weren't for style. No. They, I mean, they're beautiful, but they were meant to be worked and to, to keep warm. Yeah. And I think people, when they come here, will appreciate, like you said, the details of these um, artifacts. They're amazing. Um, the doll. Um, over here, you look at the snowshoes and what have you. I mean, these things are are old, but they are built to last. Yeah, I feel like we could take those for a spin yeah, right now and we'd be okay. <laughs> so much of the craftsmanship in these older exhibits, it's what's impressive. And when we head out to the monument in a little bit, I'll say again, I was, grew up here. So how many times I've run by, run up the monument, run by the monument, played sports in Mata Field down below it. And it wasn't until the last year or so, really, when I pull into this parking lot and I look up at that monument and you think, that they built that in 1907. Right. The detail, the craftsmanship, the fact that it's still solidly standing. We did some work to the steps this winter and some maintenance along the, along the way, of course. But for the most part, how impressive that they built that in 1907. So tell us a little bit of just about the history of the monument itself and, and how it came to be. Yeah, so the building of it itself took three years. We started in 1907 and it was finished in 1910. And it was again built to commemorate the fact that the Pilgrims first landed here. Um, so we'll see as you guys climb up it later, it's quite a climb. It's 252 feet, which equals 116 steps and 60 ramps. But the ramps are gradual, so you'll be okay. And you'll notice on the way up, you'll see different plaques of different towns with their founding year. And those are the towns that contributed to oh. the building, financially to the building of the monument, um, to really commemorate the fact that the Pilgrims landed here. Obviously, everyone in Massachusetts takes a certain pride in that. So we weren't the only town that contributed to it. Um, but yeah, we, we started in 1907, finished in 1910. We had two presidents visit during the process, one when the first cornerstone was laid, and then one when it was ultimately built and dedicated. The one thing, the, the picture's amazing too, when you look at uh, some of these items here, and you look at, uh, and I think it's great that you actually have pictures of this too, to depict the building of it, because I don't think people appreciate, you had said it earlier, uh, when you're talking about artifacts, I mean, this is 1907. <laughs> and we're on a big hill. Your viewers might not be able to tell. We'll give them some perspective when you head outside, but it is a steep hill. So if you imagine getting these granite rocks up this hill, and then ultimately 252 feet in the sky, it's just incredible. We have a uh, pens used by uh, President Roosevelt yep. um, for the, uh, the signing bill. Um, and that was to sign it, as I'm, if I'm reading it correctly, it's the signing of to get the money or to establish Yes, it. to establish yeah. that we would build this. Yeah. And then, yeah, here's a little bit of the funding. Again, a true collaboration. And what I, did it cost? $91,000. It's, it's a bargain. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a steal. Uh, interesting, too, General Court of Massachusetts, an act, um, legislature doing uh, its thing back then. You've got a couple of item uh, books here, though, which are kind of interesting. What's really cool is there's a, a family called the Cashman family. And Jay Cashman, who's currently alive right now, um, his great uncle was part of the team that laid the cornerstone of the monument. So when we built our elevator in 2020, um, he actually helped us fund the elevator. So it's cool that for all these decades, the Cashman family has been helping build the monument in some way, shape, or form. <music> As Courtney was just saying, this is sort of the nitty gritty of the, um, uh, the building itself. And I know, actually, you've got the, um, and I, I will not pronounce it correctly. I know, I never The do inspiration either. of the monument itself from, from um, Siena, Italy. From Italy, correct. But it's just amazing when um, you see the invitation to the laying. Is yeah, to the laying of the cornerstone. And here you've got two, you've got some fragments. Uh, of the granite used to build this and if there's one picture and I think you were talking about this too and how they were hauling up the mm. granite is sort of like a tr little train pulley system to it's get very it up similar and up. to the elevator and it's in the exact place where the elevator that you guys will see when we head out um, so what's interesting is we pretty much it used to bring granite up now we're just bringing people up and, and that's yeah. amazing yeah that, but that's how they had I to mean, do it right <laughs> <laughs> it's wild
So I can't get over, this is the view that you get every day when you come to so work. So magical. This is amazing. It's beautiful, isn't it? it I is. feel really lucky every day. Um, again, tell us about the structure itself as we are about to embark on this journey this up, hike up to the top. This hike up to the top. 252 feet up. The tallest all granite structure in the United States. It was built in 1907. It took three years to build it. We finished it in 1910. And it was built to commemorate the fact, as we've discussed, that the Pilgrims landed here first, stayed for five and a half weeks, got back on the Mayflower and went to Plymouth. But it was built to commemorate the fact that they came here first and that the Mayflower Compact, Compact was signed in our harbor. Is there any reason why here? This location, this particular probably? spot, yeah. I think just because it's the highest spot in town. This okay. is High Pole Hill, so I think the 252 feet of granite on top of the highest point in town, they were looking for something magnificent, and this was the most magnificent spot. It is very impressive, like I said, as, as we've looked out, and you've got just an amazing view of, yeah. of Provincetown and the it's harbor. It's spectacular, and it's interesting, I think, when our when our guests go from the museum and really learn so much about the harbors we just walked through and you see the schooners and the history and the whaling and the fishing and then you kind of come out and you can really just picture it all out here and you're like oh well yeah i was going to say i think it makes sense to go through the museum first actually yeah i think so too before you come out we here. encourage people to do that yeah yeah um that's a good idea and i just think that you, you do get a better story um about this it's amazing yeah all right we're should ready we do it? it let's do yeah, it are we doing it let's do it Nice what shot. is the building we're looking at right there? So that is the one right in front of us. That's a town hall. Oh, okay. Yeah. That you were talking about yeah. earlier. Yep. So if you take the elevator down, which we can in a little bit, it puts us right downtown in front of the town hall, in front of the bar relief, kind of in the center of the town. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's beautiful. So if you notice, um, some of the plaques are, say different things, but a lot of the plaques you'll see that it's a town name, the town they were founded, and it's because they donated to the building of the monument. So it was a real statewide pride-filled thing, and many communities and towns chipped in for the building of it. And then, yeah, you're right, there's different, it's not just towns, it's different organizations. Yeah, different happen. organizations, yep. All right, so we've made it to the top. Courtney hasn't killed me with her. Uh, she, was, <laughs> she was flying up the stairs. Um, wow, what a view. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, and really, I think one of the things that we should let people know too, I think that's interesting is there's ramps. They're not stairs. Yeah, it's not stairs the whole way up, so it's definitely doable. So Once you, you get past the first set of stairs, you can really make your way up. And I think that that's, for people who are thinking about going and coming up, that's important it's doable. because it, it's very it's a lot easier on your feet and what have you so and when we get to the bottom you get a sticker that says I made it to the top <laughs> <laughs> well that's good so yeah here's the view I think this is blocking it we might want to walk so what over are we seeing way. out here so this is the harbor this is where the pilgrims arrived and signed the Mayflower compact that's also long point so when we were inside the museum and we looked at that um, replica of the settlement of the houses that were out there before they were floated over to the mainland, um, that would be Long Point. That's Town Hall. My oh, that's oh, yeah, that's the big steeple that we saw there. My too. grandparents' house is the <laughs> white, wha white and black shuttered one right down there across the street. And my mom was born there, and it was the first church in Provincetown, and the first deed holder was Paul Revere. Wow. Yeah.
So you're saying this is a 360 degree view, but we were just looking towards Plymouth. Towards Plymouth. And then this way we'd be looking towards Boston and on a really clear day you can see both both shorelines, which is pretty great. Pretty it, great. It is amazing the view though that you have up Isn't here. Isn't it beautiful? It's really 360. When I was growing up these plastic things weren't on here, so it was a real real wild wild west up here. <laughs> From your perspective too, how much has the town grown? Has it, has it changed a lot? It's changed so much, um, so much from when I was a kid. Little things like growing up after school, like after field hockey practice, which would have been right over there on, at the field and walking to the house I just showed you on Commercial Street. Come Labor Day Tuesday, you could walk home after school and not see a soul until Memorial Day. Now that's just totally different. It's like season, like we have people coming, which is great for the economy, coming like through December, through January. So you don't get that real seasonal shift that you got to quite extremes when I was a kid. And then so many other things have changed. I mean, a lot has stayed the same. The, the, the people who love the town and, and the reasons they love the town um, are all the same, but a lot has changed, you know? You're back home and you, you were talking about your career, but it must be nice to be back home. It's so nice to be back home. Yeah. Um, for something that has been such a part of your life, really your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this has been the backdrop of my entire life, whether it was playing sports or walking home and looking up at it. So yeah, the fact that I get to be here and be in charge of this symbol of Provincetown is just so important. And I think what we're trying to do, this new leadership up here is if you love Provincetown, which people love Provincetown, if you love it, you love it. And when you look at the monument, that's the symbol of Provincetown. So the monument has long been the symbol of it. You look at it, you're filled with a visceral love. But what it hasn't been and what we're hoping to do now is to really make it the community hub of Provincetown. So come up here. Like you said, the locals still come up and it's like some do, but for some they don't come up because they just don't even think of it anymore. So we want to open it up, make it accessible, remind people to come and have lunch, climb it, take the elevator downtown, park in our parking lot. So I'm hoping that it moves from being just the symbol to the actual gathering place the for hub. the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The central park of P-Town. I have to stop and, and ask you here because this is the view as you were talking about a lot uh, during this whole day today that we've been together is that uh, this is the field this, this is, is where you uh, this is where we played sports, played growing sports up. and did everything yeah this is the field my parents played sports here my grandparents played my grandfather played football down there and uh, yeah it all happened under the the watch of the monument and you know for Provincetown we were scrappy we were a small town as we've already covered but we would we were good with sports I mean everyone made the team there were no tryouts because we we're so small right. you pretty much made varsity in like the eighth grade um, but we were really competitive we did really well it's a nice complex you can't see it from the parking lot when you pull in but when you when you're up here it's it is a, a very good complex yeah it is you have it really is and growing up none of those developments were over there those are new on top of it you've got gargoyles yeah at every corner and to put that finishing touch on 252 feet up in the sky on the highest hill in Provincetown that's something they easily could have done without and they didn't so it just goes to the craftsmanship and the work overall in this monument it's just beautiful So we've made it to the corner here, and I, we just got a plug here that this is uh, this is the high school here that you were talking about. Yep, this L is Provincetown High School. A lot of stories here for you. A lot you. of stories. I went to school here. My sisters went to school here. My parents were high school sweethearts here. One grandparent from each side went here, so lots and lots of history in that school. Your graduating class was how many? 24 kids. 24 kids. You know, you've got... Two towns, you've Turo got and Provincetown. You've got New Bedford with 450 <laughs> plus, and here we are. Uh, with 24 kids in the class. And all of our parents went to high school together and all our, I mean, to get a new kid, like a new kid came in the sixth grade, it was like a, like a zoo. <laughs> we were like, oh, we who got, are you? We gotta be all the girls ran, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're like a new boy. <laughs> That's funny. So you were making a point too that obviously there is no high school now. No. But that's, it, so a lot of people might find that 
hard to believe. Yeah, hard to believe, and it was sad back when it happened. When it, for, I was in college when it came up to town meeting, that, and it got voted on a couple years. It wasn't an immediate decision. But at first it was really hard, especially being away to college in New Orleans, you're missing home, and I loved growing up in Provincetown. It's something I'm just so grateful for and so proud of. So when word spread that we were going to no longer have a high school, once the emotion got over it, I could see that it made sense because the numbers weren't there. You know, it's, it's, it's a small high school, 24 kids. <laughs> Where do kids go now, though? Now you would get in a bus and you would go to Nauset, which is the net, which used to be our biggest rival, and now it's where we go. Or you could go to Chatham. It's now school choice on the Cape, so you could pretty much go to any school that had a high school. All right, so Courtney's gonna. Courtney already took us to the highest place in the in the area. Now we're actually looking at the elevator, which is relative, really new. Really, yeah, actually. it's really new. We um, built it, started building it in 2019, and we opened it two seasons ago. And the, it's interesting because originally, so if you go in our town hall, there are really old paintings of this hill with the monument on it. And there was a stairway. So the, in the original board of trustees of this organization always meant for there to be access from downtown up the hill. Oh, really? And they just never finished it. So for decades and decades, different boards of trustees have said, let's, let's do it. Let's put the steps up. So it was like a switchback staircase that came up. Yeah. And so seven years ago, when David Widener, my predecessor, was executive director, and when I was president, we had a board behind us that was really supportive, and we were like, let's build those stairs once and for all and change the front door, make it more accessible to the town. And then when we started the project, we realized with environmental engineers that those stairs would have been more impactful to the hill in a negative way, the way that they would have been built into the hill. Wow. And so the research showed us that an inclined elevator would be less intrusive and less harmful to the hill. Seems like it would be the opposite, but it wasn't. So we built this, shall we? Oh, shall absolutely, we yes. <laughs> you come on in, I'll let Dana get up front. It's good to get her. And good shot. It is a great view though. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? And people wonder, people ask if it's increased our attendance. It's hard to say with COVID, like what years are record or not. But I can say that half the people enter this way and half the people enter the front door. So it's definitely used just as much as our front door. Well, the good thing for you is you've, you've got the parking there too, which it helps a you lot. Park, you can, and then you can come down and spend the day and then elevator back and grab your car. Right, right. And our parking lot's always a little cheaper than everyone in town intentionally. Uh, I would find it hard to believe that this is less environmentally impactful than the stairs. Yeah, I guess the stairs, the, how deep they would have gone and the switchback to get the angle up would have just been too much. You are really in the heart of downtown. Yes. Andrea, one of our superstars. <laughs> this is New Bedford Cable Network, Andrea. Andrea is a Provincetown local like me, a couple decades younger, but... <laughs> you make it sound like you're ancient. <laughs> you're younger than I am. For and so when I pointed out my grandfather's house, it's this one right here. And this is the bas relief, which depicts the signing of the Mayflower Compact, but it's not our property. All right, so we have uh, made it to the bottom 
of the uh, elevator and what a day um, thank you so much thank you for, for coming. having us here uh, as our guests as you know as I said Dana and Sue who are uh, the videographers today they were excited to come um, it's something that all three of us had never d done was climb the, the memorial but I'm so glad you guys made the it the story was great the the museum is great uh, for folks who don't know and, and how to get in touch with you or where to find stuff, tell us a little bit about that information, sort of the administrative stuff that you're good at here. Yeah, the administrative stuff, the best way to find out about what we've got going on is our website. We're really good at keeping that up to date. And if you ever have any ideas for me specifically, you can hit me up on my email, which is on the website as well. And the one thing too, and I think that you've talked about too, is to keep in mind too, if you're looking to come down here for a visit, uh, especially during the open season, you're open from uh, April, the first April, Saturday of April through this year, December 7th, which is our annual meeting. And I think it's good too, because you said you're going to have different exhibits. Yep. So checking that website is going to be important because you're going to have a lot of different activities coming up. Yeah, in 2025, we're going to have a speaker series, a music series. We're going to have a couple different exhibits going on. So we're really going to try to give people a reason to come up here every six to eight weeks. And the one thing too that we talked about off camera, but I think it's good too, you're trying to expand sort of the, not the footprint of the property, but the footprint of the organization. There are different things, because I know, I mean, you talk about people getting married here. Somebody yeah. in New Bedford or in the, in the watching this might say, hey, yeah. So there's, tell us a little bit about that. Too. You've got different things. It's not just the museum. Yeah, it's not just the museum and the monument. We do grounds rentals. So we do weddings, we do galas for other nonprofits. We do business meetings, which are really popular. So businesses from Boston will take the ferry over. They're looking for good retreat space, spaces, getaway meeting spaces. So they take the boat over off season, get a cheaper hotel room. And then they use our museum to actually facilitate meetings and like a couple days of corporate retreat type stuff. So there's a bunch of different ways you can use our camp. This. Well, I wish you the best of luck. As, Thank you. as we said Thank too, you. as we as we record this, this is her first day as executive director. <laughs> She's been the interim um, for a while, but um, you're off and running. I think uh, you're going to do a great job. And thank you. Like I said, thanks for having us. I thank you. It. Thanks for coming. And thank you for watching this. And we hope you enjoy your holiday season. And we will see you soon.